everybody, uh, my name is Buffy Catella. I'm here with Bolton Access TV here today, and I'm joined by the lovely author, Marie Leclerc. Hello. Hello, thank you. Thank you for having I'm me. I'm excited to talk about your books, your life, everything else that you're doing today. So if we're going to start off, um, what is your newest book? What's it about? And how does it fit into your series of your other books? Ah, well, my newest book is called 1,000 Buddhas, But Who's Counting? And uh, as it turns out in my book, uh, there's a monk in the Himalayas who's charged with counting the Buddhas. And so there's a, a, an, a Buddhist tradition that says that once 1,000 Buddhas have been born, then humanity will evolve into the next age or the next level of consciousness. Yep. Or, um, and so officially, uh, according to current thought, the most recent Buddha is number four. So technically, we have a long ways to go. But um, I've taken certain liberties <laughs> with that, with that uh, tradition. And my book says we're down to 999. And so it's, a, it's not about Buddhism, it's a story about our, uh, some reluctant heroes that are tasked with finding the Buddhas um, and keeping them safe so that they live to adulthood and live to enlightenment. So that's sort of the gist of the story. And there's a little bit of a magic component to it. So, you know, the tie-in um, for, for me as an author is that, at least so far, my three books, um, have all had a little bit of the unusual in them. Okay. And so this also has a little bit of the unusual in it. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. And that uh, 1,000 Buddhas pu published in November of just this okay. past year. Very new. Hot off the press. I was going to say hot <laughs> off the press, right? Hot off the press. So what are your other books? So you have two other books. What are they about? Because I know that they're somewhat connected. They are somewhat connected. So the very first book I wrote is called The Last Yard Sale. And that book is uh, it's about a mysterious yard sale that is hosted by an elderly woman. And there's only, three, there's only four items available at the yard sale. Mm -hmm. And they are a baby doll, a music box, a photo with a frame, and a prayer book. And so the story actually begins with the woman who happens upon the yard sale and picks up these items, which, are, which give her visions of her life and of the life of the elderly woman. Mm -hmm. And the story evolves around how these items change her life and, and cause her to look at her life differently. Um, and there's a little bit of romance, uh, but mostly, you know, my books are also what are called cozy um, stories, okay. which means there's no graphic sex and there's no graphic violence in them. So they're kind of G-rated, if you will. <laughs> like Hallmark? Yeah, yeah, kind of, but I like to, well, yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I would say better than Hallmark. <laughs> <laughs> well, like yeah, I, no offense, Hallmark uh, lovers. <laughs> I know. I knew. I I met a kid. Well, he's not a kid. He's like twenty five. One, one of my friends, family friends. His mother writes Hallmark movies. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know what that must be like. Yeah. It, there's a science to it, though, right? Yeah. Because you have to hit like, you apparently. I I heard that you can only kiss after a, a certain page. Oh, limit. I would say that's probably like Hallmark probably yeah. has their own template. Yes, yes their own template yes. about what how things have to go. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so, what would you describe your genre of writing? So, over the overall umbrella is something that's called literary fiction. So, literary fiction is sort of includes all those things that don't fall into any other category. Okay. Um, however, there's also a subgenre of fiction called uh, mystical fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes there's a, another sort of category called urban fantasy. Okay. And so they're both a, sort of the same, um, but they all take place present day, but they all have just a little bit of the unusual. So what is your process for self-publishing a book? Because you've self-published all three of these, right? Yes, so yes. How does that, e I don't even know how that works. Yeah, yes, well, um, so first of all, I did try and go the traditional route with my first book. 
Um, but it's really hard to break in in that way. Mm. Um, and there's so many people writing books now that, you know, it's hard to show up on anybody's radar. So uh, last time I checked, the statistics from Amazon, which is the main uh, self-publishing yeah. arena at the moment, um, there are over 600 books published daily. Really? On Amazon. Yes. So, <laughs> how do you? Yeah, that's crazy. How do you it's get crazy. someone to read your book if there's well, so many? The book, the yeah. it's so saturated. The market. Right? It, it is really, it is extremely saturated. And I have to say that I'm not much of a marketer. Yeah. And I didn't write my books. Um, to some extent, I of course like to make money on them, but mostly I write because I've just found that I love writing. Yeah. And so I published my first book with no intention whatsoever except to publish a book. Yeah. To go through the process and, you know, the first, uh, the first year and a half, I, I sold like 35 books. All right, so it's not, yeah. a, it's not a blockbuster. Yeah. <laughs> it's not breaking any records. Um, and those were people that know me and love me. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, so I'm not much of a marketer. Um, but I just feel like if I don't publish it, then nobody will read it. Yep. And what I'm finding is, is that I enjoy this kind of marketing. Yeah. Um, better than trying to get people to click on it on Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but Amazon is really the self-publishing platform. Yeah. But there are a couple other smaller ways to go, but mostly really Amazon, and they make it incredibly easy. Really? Um, to, well, I say that after my third book. My first book didn't feel incredibly easy, truth be told. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but there are, it's, it, it, you upload a Word document, so it's not anything remarkable in that way. Yeah. And they tell you exactly how to format it, and you upload it onto their page, and then you get to preview it, so you can tell if your formatting is off at all, and you just make adjustments um, as you need to, and it's an ebook. And there it is, it's an ebook. Uh, my, I get my covers, I actually purchase my covers, but some people do their own. You can certainly upload your own um, content in that way if you want. Uh, and yeah, and, and the, the process for print is pretty much the same, yep. except that there's a little bit more formatting involved. And now, nowadays, um, your books are print on demand. So that means that Amazon does not have a massive warehouse where they keep all these 600 books a day, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, and so when you buy a book online now, they literally put the file in the computerized printer and print you off a book. So in that way, uh, publishing has really been transformed by technology in that now literally anybody can write a book uh, and get it published and publish it yourself and, and have a book. So, mm -hmm. so it's much, much easier, uh, and uh, I only, I only um, like pay if somebody, if they print my book, you know, they, there's a, a, the fee arrangement is that they take, a, they, they take the cost of printing out of my, whatever, my, my uh, royalties. So it's no, it's a, it's no initial outlay for me mm -hmm. as an author. Uh, so yeah, it's working out well. I'm enjoying it. Yeah. You know? So yeah. So the second book, so the first book was um, The Last Yard Sale. The second book is the same characters, um, but it, it's a, an independent story. So you don't necessarily have to read one to read the other, but if you want the back story, then yeah. you got to go back and read the first one. Because <laughs> it's the romance, the romance from the first one goes into the second yes. book, right? Yes. So yes. if you want to yes. see the sparks of the romance, if you want to know how it all began. <laughs> yes. You know that the moment that when they made eye contact and you knew that they loved each other. I don't know. I haven't read the book. They actually didn't like each other very much. They, they, yeah. I love. I love that when in when relationships in yeah. books or movies they start off with, "Ooh, I hate you." A little bit of animosity. Yeah. And just a little antagonism. And then yeah. you're, they're like, "Oh, it's just." It, it all works out at the end, yeah. <laughs> We've talked about your, the books you've written, your stories, but what about your personal story? Mm. Where do you come from? Because mm -hmm. I know where you, where you started and where you're currently is the same place, but in between, 
is now. Yeah, there's a whole story. Yeah. yeah, there's a whole story there. So I was born and raised in Worcester. And uh, my family still lives in Worcester and or thereabouts, the surrounding towns. Um, so, but I, I was restless. Uh, yeah. As a teenager, I was very restless. And so after I graduated from high school, I joined the Air Force at 18 and, you know, went off to see the world. And after that, I just had that travel bug and I just never quite settled down. So I've moved, I've probably, if I stopped to count, I've probably moved as many times as I've had a birthday. <laughs> <laughs> in my adult life. Really? I've even been, I've been back to Worcester uh, coming up on not quite two years. It'll be two years in August. And I've already had two addresses in Worcester. So I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm, I'm fairly mobile. Uh, and I moved here from Virginia Beach, Virginia. And I moved there from Florida. And I moved there from New Mexico. And I moved to New Mexico from Maryland. How do you keep track of all this? Yeah. I feel like I would be like, where, <laughs> where was this? I forget where does this end on yes. the timeline. Well, yes, and so I really don't keep track of it that much, but every once in a while I have to fill out some kind of a form mm -hmm. that says, you know, list your last like three addresses or whatever, and half the time I can't even remember. <laughs> I have to look them up. My, I, say, I, I, I joke that my personal uh, uh, ROM, my personal memory bank, yeah, I can hold one phone number and one address. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. I think that's why when you called to see if you can make an appointment, well, not mm -hmm. make an appointment, but mm -hmm. come on to our show, it was like, New Mexico? Like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Who, why would somebody from New Mexico want to come to Bolton Access? Right. But, well, because I still have my phone number. Yeah. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. From New Mexico, so. Yeah, yeah. and I was curious, so you joined the Air Force when you were 18, and I feel like the Air Force is a predominantly male-dominated thing. Yes. How yes, was that yes. like for you? And especially, it was, not, it was a long time ago, right? Mm -hmm. So how, how did that affect you? So uh, overall, my time in the service was positive. Yeah. And so I'll just say, you know, I, it, it, it got me out of town, which is what I wanted. Yeah. And I met some incredible people. And, and even just in four years, so I, I, I did just one enlistment, yep. which was four years at the time. I had to make a four-year commitment. And uh, I'm still in touch with a couple of the folks that I met back then. Um, I was in at a time when women were really just claiming their space and really just kind of demanding um, to have access to certain jobs. So up until then, at least in the Air Force, I think the Army might have uh, got on board a little sooner, let's yep. just say. But when I joined the Air Force, um, I was the first training unit to wear fatigues. Up until then, the woman wore skirts and blouses, even in basic training. And there were certain things that they didn't have to do in basic training that the men had to do. And so I, I was literally the first unit that had to do at least almost everything that the men did, um, including the obstacle course, which up until then we didn't have to do. I fired an M16 rifle. I had to qualify on an M16 rifle in basic training. Um, and we wore fatigues. And so literally when we went through the, the issue um, for for uniforms, there were uniforms that wouldn't fit me. They didn't have my size. <laughs> I had to special order my combat boots. <laughs> um, and so in that way it felt, you know, now that I look back at the time, you know, I was just, you know, involved in what was going on around yeah. me. But as I look back, I really appreciate that transition um, and the jobs that had opened up for women just right before I went in. So it was exciting. So the long answer. You yeah, well, no, that's super cool because you pay you, you were one of the first people to kind yeah. of like pave the way. So yeah. yes, yes. And so for me, I know that there's a lot of people that have some very um, disturbing stories about the military, but honestly for me, uh, it was really fine. It was fine. It was a great experience. Everyone who I've talked to who was in the Air Force, mm -hmm. like really enjoyed it. <laughs> And I think that's just, I, I, other things are more yeah. hazy, but the people in the Air Force were like, yeah, yeah. yeah. they really enjoyed it. 
it, it, it does, it is looked on a little bit as a little bit more cushy. Um, and in fact, the army refers to us as the chair force. <laughs> <laughs> because we do, I will admit, the Air Force has a little bit of a more cushy job. We like put the army in the back of the airplanes and fly over and push them out the back. And you know, <laughs> so yeah, it's a little, uh, so, so it's, a, it's a little easy. Did, so in the Air Force, were you a pilot or? No, I no. was a bus driver. Sorry, no glamour there. <laughs> I worked out of the motor pool. I know there's a lot of people out there perhaps that can relate. I worked out of the motor pool. And uh, I drove, um, uh, a lot of what I did was I drove air crews, I drove out on the, on the tarmac mm -hmm. and out to the aircraft. And so I delivered air crew out to the aircraft or occasionally drove uh, some VIPs around or um, other, you know, sort of uh, one-time assignments. Uh, so yeah, it was pretty fun. You're the OG Uber driver. I am the Uber, the Uber driver. <laughs> I am. <Yeah. laughs> so much. So, but it was nice. It was overall, it was, uh, like I said, it was great. Traveled around, um, spent a year and a half up in Fairbanks, Alaska. Wow. Um, which, you know, normally I wouldn't have put that on my list, but it, you, it was impressive. It. Yeah. It was nice. It was fun. It was, uh, it was nice all around. Yeah. Why did you want to be a writer? What about writing? You know, I, I didn't, I didn't want to be a writer. <laughs> <laughs> I never wanted to be a writer. It never occurred to me to be a writer. Um, and as I think as, as it happens for a lot of people as you get older and you've d lived your life and done your career and you start to think about, you know, you've raised your family, whatever, you start to think about what other things uh, might be fun. And so a lot of times people turn to the creative endeavors. And so people, you know, start painting in their retirement or, um, you know, offer community service or do other things. And so there was just this uh, conversation that I had with friends at one point where we were talking about, uh, we were talking about downsizing. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all getting, you know, kids are gone, getting smaller houses, blah, this and that. And we talked about, wouldn't it be nice to, if we could just put all of our emotional junk out on the lawn and sell that along with all of our other stuff, you know, having yard sales, yeah. clearing out. And, and so the, the story just kind of snowballed about what we might sell. <laughs> and that's how the, the, the uh, initial story came about. And so it just started writing itself in my head. Literally just, it, 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 I couldn't shut it off. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, oh, well, I'll just write it out. And so I just wrote it out. And next thing I knew, I had a substantial manuscript. Um, and people that had read it, as I was writing it. So every, I'd, I'd write a chunk and then I'd send it out and then I'd write a chunk and then I'd send, yeah. it, send it out to a few people just for fun, you know, just for fun. Yeah. And then um, I, I paused in my writing uh, for a moment. Things got a little busy and I was getting emails saying, well, well where's the next? <laughs> What's <laughs> happening next in the story? <laughs> where's the rest of the story? Um, and so from there, I just ended up with a manuscript and, and here we are. <laughs> and here I am three books later, and I got a couple more in my head. Yeah, <laughs> don't you love that when you have all the ideas in your head? And yes. I, I love how, because I write too, I'm, I mm -hmm. write more plays and screenplays, that type of stuff. But still, you get an idea in your head, and then you're writing, and then you check the time, and it's like three hours has passed, and you felt like you've been there for like 20 minutes. Right? Does it, yeah. Do you get in a hole? And, and it sort of just creates itself as I'm writing. Yes. You know, yeah. I'm not, there's a couple different ways that people write novels, and um, I'm sure it's the same to some extent for, for uh, stage and screenplays. Yeah. Um, but there's, there's a process of plotting it out and developing your characters yeah. and doing all this stuff before you start to write. And then there's the other process where you just start, start with doing a blank it. page, yeah. <laughs> once upon a time and off you go. And so that tends to be more my process. People ask me, how do I, you know, how do I come up with a story? And everything is, is a prompt yes, for a story. Yes, exactly. Everything. So 1,000 Buddhas, there's a, um, there's a garden mm -hmm. in Montana, just north of Missoula, called the Garden of a Thousand Buddhas. And I happened to be out that way. I saw the gardens. I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. I went to check it out. And from that visit, and it's literally a gar, a beautiful manicured garden yep. that has 
a thousand statues of the Buddha. Um, beautifully aligned in the you know spokes from the center, and it's really lovely. It's a it's a very interesting place. But from that came this whole story. Yeah. About, Whoa, wow, that's kind of interesting. I didn't ha I never heard that tradition before. Exactly. So yeah, so everything becomes a story. I agree too. I'm the, I'm the same way. I like to sometimes I'm just in the shower and I get an idea or <laughs> some some of my dreams. I'm like, this is so weird, and then I write it down, right? But it's it's interesting because. I think, and you can probably t attest to this too, I always think that other people can kind of do the same thing, but other people don't think the same way at all. No. <laughs> They're, like my roommate I, at school is a nursing major, and she's, she doesn't even have dreams. Like she doesn't dream at all. So I'm, I'm, like, I'm like, you wait, you don't visualize anything? You don't have any ideas no. of what you're in? Isn't that crazy? Isn't that interesting? I know we assume that because we do it, and fairly easily. Yeah. Um, that other people can do it, they just like choose not to. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> no, they just literally can't do it. They can't write stories, which I think they, they can do other things. Like she's incredi of incredibly talented with science. She's going to be right. a nurse, right? Of course. But if you were to throw some chemistry at me, I would have no idea yeah. what I'm doing. So I, it's interesting how people have different strengths. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's what makes us so interesting, mm -hmm. right? If we were all the same, it would be very boring. Right. <laughs> there would be nothing yeah. to write about. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. If we were all the same, there would be nothing. No stories to tell. There'd be no stories. What is your goal as a writer? Like, what is the milestone that you'd like to check off your box? You know, it's interesting. I'd like to write everything in my head. How much is in your head? Um, right now, I have uh, I have two working manuscripts. Oh, at the same time. Yeah, yeah. I don't suggest it. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say that's that's <laughs> difficult. I don't, I don't suggest it. I really only do work out one at a time, and then when, when I get stuck on one, like you I'll flip over there. to the yeah. other. Um, and I have another yard sale story uh, cooking in my head at the moment. Um, and so yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't have a lot of. I, I don't. It'd be nice to actually make money at writing, but the truth is, is that most authors do not make a full-time salary, what would be a living wage for a family, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, as authors. Even people that are traditionally published generally have other incomes, unless mm -hmm. you're a huge, you know, hugely famous, popular, yeah. you know, Stephen King, yeah. you know. Um, so, so in that sense, you know, it's not, for me, it hasn't been about the, the being successful in that way. Mm -hmm. To me, it's about writing a story that somebody wants to read mm -hmm. and that they enjoy mm -hmm. and then just sharing that. So that's pretty much, yeah, that's why I write. That's my goal. That's my end game. Your end that's game. That's my end game. Your Avengers end game. <laughs> <laughs> the superhero. My superpower. <laughs> <laughs> we've talked on the phone before and mm -hmm. we've talked about how you wrote a screenplay for one of your books. Yes. So how is writing a screenplay different than writing a novel? And, uh, and yeah. what was that process like? And what is going on with that screenplay what, what, for oh, you? Oh, good question, yes. Because there is a little bit of activity there, which is kind of exciting. So the difference between, for me, the difference between the novel and the screenplay, and, and I assume across the board, is that you have to speak everything. Mm -hmm. So in your book, you can, you can narrate um, about what a character is thinking or yeah. feeling. And in a movie, you really have to say it. If it's an important information, you have to say it right out loud. Mm -hmm. If your client, if client, excuse me, <laughs> if your, if your, character, your character, if your character is experiencing a flashback to childhood, then you have to actually say that. Mm -hmm. And you have to show that. You can't just sort of infer, mm -hmm. you know. So in that sense, it was different. Um, in some ways, it was easy after I had written the novel because literally I just copied chunks of dialogue yeah. out of the novel, plunked it into the screenplay format, and then made it work, worked with the transitions and filled in the information that wasn't you know d transferable through the dialogue so I didn't think it was that difficult in that way uh, I did have to cut my some of my story out because when you're working in a novel you can make it as long as you like 
And when you're working in a script or, or a screenplay, you have 90 pages because movies are a set length. Mm -hmm. And to have 90 pages, and true for stage, I'm sure to some extent, yeah. maybe not quite so rigid. You, you're running like, you're running a minute a page. Right, right. right. So. And, so, and so along with that, there are certain markers that you need to meet at 30 minutes, at 60 minutes, yep. at 90 minutes, right? This is what you do with your, you get your writing books, your yes, screenwriting right. books, like Save, the, right. Save the Cat. Or Saving the Cat yeah. is a great, if you want to write screenplays, read Saving the Cat. Yeah. Um, it's a really great, simple book uh, that really helps you to outline yep. the, the rhythm of a movie. That, you know, I don't really pay any attention to when I'm watching movies. I don't know about anybody else, but I don't pay any attention. I'm absorbed in the movie. And so, so in that sense, it was a little bit of a, a more of a tell um, out loud than, this, than the book was. Um, so, so there's a website that I have. I have a, my, so hmm. there's a process with screenplays to get what's called a cover, which is a review by people who write screenplays or by industry professionals. And they read your script and they kind of grade you and they give you thoughts about your script. And so I've had my script covered and it comes out about at a B, so I'm, I'm kind of happy with that, <laughs> considering it's the first time I've ever written anything, so I'm like, I'm good with that. Yeah, it's <laughs> not like you're failing. You're not, fine. Yeah, they didn't say, oh my God, don't quit your day job. <laughs> <laughs> this is awful. What are you, what are you thinking? <laughs> go, 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 go to Hallmark. Don't ever call us again. <laughs> go right for Hallmark. Right for Hallmark. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... So, and so there's a website, um, there's a lot of websites, yeah. but the, there's a particular website that I've uploaded my script onto called Tail Flicks, which makes itself available to industry professionals. Yeah. And so anybody who's written either a novel or a screenplay um, can post their information on there. And so sometime in the next few weeks, I'm not sure when yet, um, my script will be sort of part of a review package that will be available for professionals to review. So, so I don't know. Could, it could be bought. It could be. And then they could be. It could be. So the difference <laughs> with what I find very interesting, and I don't know if you know this, for theater and film, is that if you, write, if you were to turn this into a play, you as the author and the playwright, you always have authority over it, right? Mm -hmm. So you can pull your play at the last minute if you don't like how the direction's oh. going. So you always have creative liberty over your play where when someone buys your screenplay, that's no longer yours. Someone yeah. can take that to wherever they want, which I didn't even know that was a thing. I learned that in my playwriting class. Yes. So that's, I was like, wow, that's very dangerous. Imagine if you're about to put on a play and then the play writes like. Well, right, if somebody doesn't like the, the, the blocking yeah. or. <laughs> yeah, they're like, oh, no, you're not. Or you have an argument over politics yeah. and then. <laughs> yeah, sorry, we're not doing, doing this play anymore, bye. Uh, right, but yeah, sc screenplays, they can get bought and then complete, you don't even know, it could be completely changed by the time they get, it gets true. to the screen. That's true. You can make different deals with yeah. the production, yeah. but as a first-time screenwriter, you can have my script for ten bucks. Yeah. <laughs> you can do anything you want with it. <laughs> so as long as someone's making it, <laughs> yeah, right. That's the honor is all. Yeah. Like someone's it's, doing it's something. The bragging yeah. rights. Yeah, yeah. It's Someone bought my script. It's uh, you know. That's right. It's good. <laughs> that's right. That's right. But there are, you know, as you uh, become more of a professional in the in the yeah. field, um, you can. Uh, negotiate certain yeah. <laughs> things, C certain yeah, certain nuances about it. Uh, but uh, but honestly, most of the time, it, it really is just a straight purchase. Yeah. Um, or they do what's called a, an option, and so they they'll buy the option uh, to your script for eighteen months. And if they have not produced it in eighteen months, then you can put it back up for sale. Yeah. So. Yeah, I've I've heard people get stuck in that phase too. Yeah. yeah. So, and it's interesting how everything can get kind of stuck in just pre-production too. It's like yeah. they can buy your script, but there's no guarantee that they'll ever make or do anything right. with it, right? That's right. They can film it and then never do anything else with it. Mm -hmm. they, you know, so there's really a lot of, a, a long process along the way. And my understanding is that from the time somebody buys your script till it hits the, the screen, 
It can be five to eight years. Yeah. Five to eight years in process. So, yeah. There, there it is. And that's the, that's the process. I hope I live long enough. <laughs> I think you'll be fine. So, in your yard sale book, there's magical items that you find at the yard sale. Yes. So, if you could find any magical item at a yard sale, what would it be and why? Ah, it would be, it would be a crystal ball. Okay, why? A crystal ball. Uh, so that I could see all the possible futures. Okay, so there's more than, so the future's not fixed in this world. There's all different ways you can go. That's what I think, that's what I believe, is okay. that, that, um, that everything that we do, every decision that we make, even the smallest decision, yeah. shifts, our, shifts our timeline, so to speak. Like the butterfly, is it the butterfly effect? Sort of like the butterfly effect, okay. exactly. In that, you know, whether I decide to drive home this way or that means I either avoid the accident or I'm involved in the accident. Yeah. Whether I, you know, all those little decisions that we make as well as the big ones. And so I think that every time we make a decision, we alter our direction ever so slightly. And so that crystal ball could come in kind of handy. <laughs> I'm trying to think what I would, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what I, because maybe, I'm thinking like Harry, something from Harry Potter maybe, but like do you, do you like a magic wand? A wand would be cool. <laughs> oh, I don't know if this. Oh, is you can buy magic wands by the way, at um, Enchanted Passages Bookstore. Really? You can. Do do they actually uh, have magic? No. I don't. Well, I well, the magic isn't in the wand. It's in, it's in what you make of it. It's, it's in the, the waiver. The, okay. Right? It's in the operator. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I don't know if I have any magical abilities. Oh. I, was think this, I don't know if this is magical, but I would love to just get a lightsaber oh. at, a, at a yard sale. Yeah. Wouldn't that be cool? That would be cool. And that would be cool. You could be like, look at me. Would you like trim your hedges with it? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I would just do landscaping. That's all you need. When, a one one tool landscaping company. <laughs> be great. It'd be so fast too. And people would be like, "Oh, are you using it as a weapon?" No, no. I, I hate violence. No, no. It's literally just for show and landscaping. Imagine them just these. to impress my friends. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I mentioned the Enchanted um, Passages bookstore, which yeah. is in Sutton, um, because first of all, it's a lovely bookstore. Yeah. Um, and also, my books are there, so I have my books on the shelf at a couple places. I saw that they were on. Are they in Barnes? At Barnes. Well, Noble? they are in Barnes and Noble, but only online. Okay. Only online. So, um, the Book Lovers Gourmet in Webster, mm -hmm. um, Enchanted Passages in Sutton, and Annie's Book Swap in Worcester. Okay. Currently have my books. And if you want to borrow them, um, the Upton Library and the Hopedale Library wow. have them. And soon to be in the Worcester Library. I haven't quite gotten around to it yet, but soon to be in the Worcester Library. And also, if you want to uh, talk more with me, I'm going to be doing a talk at the Worcester Senior Center. Wow. Um, on the 23rd at 10 o'clock in the morning. And just answering questions and, you know, somewhat like this, just sharing my experience. So if you want to come down, and, and I'll be selling my books. So wow. if you want to come down, come down and say hello. Do you want to plug your social media? Do you have... You know, I'm not big on social media, but I do have a Facebook page um, for Marie LeClaire, yeah. which is um, uh, my name. And then I have a... The Last Yard Sale also has a Facebook page and Instagram... I have um, uh, Marie LeClaire, and uh, I do have a Twitter account, but obviously I, I didn't really understand Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't really use it, but I post occasionally on the other two. But again, that's my thing about, you know, that whole marketing deal is, yeah. you know, I would much rather do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand. So, yeah. Do you have anything else you want to say before we end? I don't think so. I think we, t we touched no, on your life, nice. your books. No. I know, on a scale of one to amazing, how did this interview go? For amazing. You? Thank you. I try. Uh, <laughs> amazing. It's been a while. So. It's amazing. Well, it's always fun. Thank you for coming. Um, and thank you guys for watching. Uh, stay tuned. You never know. We may get some more authors on here now. Yeah. We're starting a trend. I know. I don't I know. Could, 
I got a call. Do you have friends? I could make it happen. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you guys for watching and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.